there are times when you're in pain and if you can just sort of, it's not, there's right pain and wrong pain. Your foot is like broken, stop running. I just don't do sound guidance or something here. But, um, but no, when you, when you, you know, if your heart feels like it's gonna explode out of your chest because you've just gone too far, slow down a little bit. But if you can sort of feel the pain a little bit, the next thing you know, you feel, you go into like another mode. And it's a mode of achievement, it's a mode of self-confidence, it's a, you know, and everybody knows when you, <coughs> that when runners go on a long run, you know, that runners high or whatever, but, but yeah, I mean, when I finished the triathlon, uh, the, uh, 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 you ask a triathlete about a triathlon, you're gonna get a four hour answer. <laughs> it's like, you know, so but the, one, the, the Iron Man caught up 15 hours and 30 minutes and 30 seconds. I know, because there's a photograph in my video. <laughs> but that was one of the greatest days of my life. Getting married, my birth of my three daughters, getting cast in Lord of the Rings. Um, there's certain big, you know, graduating from college, you know, but flying in an F-18. There have been certain things that were just like, oh, this is, this is a, a moment of, you know, that goes in your biography after you're, you're gone from this world. You know, if anybody's interested to look back, they'll be like, oh, you did a, we did a radio show with their podcast, that's interesting. We did a triathlon, whoa, that's like, it's impressive. And I was like, um, I would tell everybody what I was doing. I did 12 big, big city marathons, and when you sort of pump it up like it's a thing that you're doing, you're kind of like burning your boats behind you, because right. if you fail, if you stop, then you, you've created an expectation for people. You know, they're all like, oh, hey, how'd you do? And it's a bummer to be like, oh, I didn't make it. But when you say, I'm gonna do this, and that's part of like how you push through the pain too. It's like I've I've created an expectation for myself and with other people, and, and generally it, it works out pretty pretty well. We're gonna have to go back to it now, I guess. <laughs> and so there's one more question, and we can probably eliminate half of this line. Uh, I don't know because is it's only one line. Yes, yeah, just that one line. Right? Okay. So we talked about this before. If you can only have potatoes served one way. <laughs> <laughs> Flambe. <laughs> Rotten. I don't know. We try to push back on the whole the whole match and taking this to business. <laughs> people always come up in line with potatoes. And I started thinking people are a little lazy. <laughs> mash them up. Why not give me a little bag of garlic mash in there or something? Also, 
appearing in Encino Man. And his counterpart, Ki Hui Kwan. From the Goonies and uh, 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 Temple of Doom fame, won the best <coughs> supporting actor Oscar last year. So there's a picture of Linkovich and Ki talking to each other. And in the background are the two non-Academy Award winners, Alan Shore and John Aston. <laughs> so, so there's a so I fashioned myself a serious actor in those days. I had just played a drug addict in this really serious film called Where the Day Takes You. And when it came time to do uh, Encino Man, I kind of looked down my nose at it a little bit. Yeah. I did not realize that doing broad comedy with a heart is something that audiences will latch on to forever. I didn't, I was too young to understand the about that. Like 50 First Days? Like 50 First Days. Yeah. Woo! It's a deceptively heartwarming movie and as much as you have to fall and make your, your loved one fall in love with you anew every single day. Like that and walrus sperm jokes. It's like, you know. <laughs> but there was this, so I was taking myself too seriously on that. And, um, and I remember we were doing a scene where the swing pool, the, the hole we did dug in the backyard. Yeah. And I was, and that's where we're going to, we live this discovery. But um, the homage to Risky Business, where Guido the Killer Pimp, played by Joe Pantacanano <coughs> of Fratelli and the Goonies, um, threw that, that glass artwork, and Tom Cruise goes diving through the air to catch it. Well, we were doing that with what they called the Moosterian Bowl, which was a, like a five pound wooden bowl. And though, so what they did was they, they dug a hole in the a hole in the hole in the ground uh, so that the camera could be on a tripod, but it would it would stick out of the ground like two feet. Okay. So then, but I would run and jump and dive over the camera. That sounds so like fun. It was well. <laughs> <laughs> so I fashioned myself quite the uh, physical person. And so I would do it and run and plant my foot and dive over it and land in the pad and it was awesome and we did it and we did it and it was like, okay, we got it. And I said, let me do it one more time because uh, it's always the one more time. It's always the one more time. And I, what happened was I, when I could, s where the camera was, you could see me look at my foot to plant and then turn. And I thought it would be really cool if I was already looking over my shoulder and planted in turn. So as you might anticipate, I, my foot did not land properly on the wheelbarrow. And I went straight down. And I remember Gil Combs, the stunt director, stunt, um, what do you call it, a coordinator, yeah. He sort of tried to catch me as I was falling into this little pit. And they had set up this wooden thing. So I hit my, my cheek and my eye. And it was like, uh-oh, so I, it was in the afternoon, we didn't ruin the whole day, but basically it was like, you need to go. My dad was like, I called my dad on the phone, I'm like, listen, I kind of got hurt on the side, not bad, but he was like, well, you got to check your orbit. <laughs> I had never heard the word orbit related to the eye, but apparently my dad knew all about it. <laughs> so I, I went to the doctor, and I can't remember, but anyhow, uh, orbit was fine. So I come back to work the next day, you asked. So, work the next day and we're gonna do the scene where I land yeah. okay so they put the camera on the ground and in the foreground on the ground they put a piece of hard plastic to make it look like it was the ice yeah like shiny it's an iceberg or yeah. whatever the, yeah what is it called ice something I the ice <laughs> and then they cover it up with dirt so I'm so I'm gonna land like say you're the camera on the ground, I'm gonna land right with my face right in the foreground. Right, it's kind of a very yeah. dramatic yeah. thing. And then I'm gonna move the thing and the camera kind of little tilt down, you can see it. So I really wanted it to look like I was flying in and landing. So each time we were rehearsing the first few things, I'd back up farther and farther. And finally, I was like stood up and backed up and I was gonna like run and dive and land with this five pound Mysterian bolt stretched out in front of me. So I, I ran and I dove and I landed and the Mysterian bolt hit the plastic and bounced off and hit me in the head. And my eye went and it just swelled up. Right? So, so I, yeah, so then I, we had to stop from the day again and it's like, John asked 
Madison does not know how not to get hurt. <laughs> when I came back the next day, uh, there was a crash helmet that the studio had. <laughs> they wanted a you know, special at least wear the crash helmet and like he's actually filming a scene. So, it does feel like one of the most memorable experiences. So you're telling me that two minutes took like three days of beating yourself up. That's fantastic. Correct. And, and Les Mayfield, the director, who could tell I like wasn't having fun doing the movie. Like I was, I was trying to be professional, but I, I like, just didn't. My heart wasn't in that movie. I know, but it sort of worked for that character. It did. Like, right? He's the anchor yeah. for the two goofy guys. Okay. He says rationalizes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we got lunch years later, and he said, you know, I could tell how bummed he was. I was like, I didn't mean to be. He's like, I think it was good. I was just. He goes, I know, I know. He goes, like you got hurt trying to make it good. He said that made me feel good about your participation. No, you were trying. You wanted it to be good, and uh, so that was. Thank you. Four-hour answer. Yeah. Get through the whole line. What is your name? My name's Colin. Colin, my question is: With 51st Dates, how is making a comedy like that different from some of the drama series like Lord of the Rings, Stranger Things, and how's working with comedians like Evanston? Thank you for that. Uh, there are no Balrogs, Ringrings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Uh, even if it's just a normal like eight or nine or ten hour day, it's not a long day. Some people like actually work, you know, in foundries, and it's hard that you, you know, physical work. But you do when you have to kind of like be chill for a long time, and then get ready and kind of like be be funny. It's a little. It's it, it requires like a little professional skill to be able to do that. And with someone like Adam, who did his, you know, his Saturday Night Live is where he made his whole relationship with the American public and really refined his comedic style and all that, he he would look at those at a shot. Usually when you're making a movie, it's like, okay, we're going to get a two shot, we'll pop in for a close-up, we're going to step back and get kind of a master shot, whatever. There's, oh, this is going to be an interesting tracking shot that comes into a close-up, whatever. When Adam would do a shot, the camera would be set, and then it was like, Saturday Night Live, like, you're gonna go in and do this shot, and this, like, you know, good luck. The idea of saying good luck before each shot was like, terrifying, like, like, you know, we're just, we're in it, we're gonna, and uh, so that was, that was interesting, learning his, his kind of rhythm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I love, I got to do uh, 20 episodes of a sitcom called uh, No Good Nick for Nickelodeon, which I just love doing, I'm on the Connors right now, I got to do like, um, an episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and a few episodes of Big Bang Theory, and like, yep. those multi-cam in front of our, actually big, uh, 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 what do you call Brooklyn Nine-Nine was a single cam. But the, the television rhythm of, you know, especially if there's an audience, is so, um, so fluid. It's simple. You know, your day, Monday, you go in and you do a table read, and that's it. Your, work, your Monday is like two hours of work. Your Tuesday is like, the week plays out. You have to know, they want to like letter perfect the, the words. So in terms of memorization, that's the real trick. So all afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, when you're like learning the dialogue, but there's just something about the, the work is building towards when everyone's gonna do it. So if you think of like a baseball game or sports or a concert or something, there's the time before the show, before the game starts, where people are in the locker room and they're kind of getting ready, and everyone knows that you're going to be kind of peaking at a certain moment. You could, and then you and then you do the show, and everyone's like pumped for that. Movies and television are not usually like that, but that comedy rhythm I, I dig a lot. Thank you. Good question. Thank you.
so okay, let's get serious and talk about our tunes. Yes, I want to thank you for an amazing job as Raphael. character for you, very angry and aggressive. Just wondering, do we have any more Sean Astin angry characters? Maybe you've been a villain. Is that what? Maybe. Maybe. Well, somebody came up to me today in the line and asked me why Raphael was so angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't have a good answer. I mean, I like, my, the first thing I thought was, well, they kind of represent, it's like the dwarves. They all represent some part of ourselves. Yes. But that's not a good enough answer. You're like, what in Raph's backstory, you know, sort of got him going? Or do we, are we all kind of dyspeptic or happy? Is, is, that, is that a DNA thing? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> But I loved doing that character, and I wish it went on for another 10 seasons. It really oh, was something yeah. special to do, particularly with Rock Paulson, who was the OG, Raphael, and, and um, Greg Sipes, and just the whole gang. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, it's funny. I, I am a journeyman actor. And I really think, you know, there were moments in my career where that might not have been true. You know, you're sort of a star, where you're a leading man type character, something like that. But the way I've always like chosen people, like, have you turned out anything that ever went on to be great? I'm like, no. I'm going to be great, you can tell right up front. <laughs> so I go where the work is, you know, and a lot of times it's low budget independent films, you know, or Florida, or whatever, Mexico, or one, or whatever. I just, I want to work if they've got a little bit of money in the budget and there's something interesting to do, or depending on how I meet the person, and so I've done truly vicious, horrible, psychopathic killers. <laughs> That's not what people know me for. <laughs> That's not what they know me for. So, um, so I have no qualms about playing that. And in fact, there was a period of time where filmmakers were like, oh, we should get Sean to be like the bad guy because no one would be expecting that. In fact, in Stranger Things, people were like, I'm sure you were a bad guy. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> so, and when and after I died, a, like a couple months later, I, I called the doctors and I was like, so listen, uh -huh. what if Bob was actually the mind flare? <laughs> I was like, what if what if that was what if Bob was just a manifestation of evil, but he was using Bob to spy on Joyce? They went now. <laughs> But there's this guy in Missouri who really wants it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as an actor, you want to stretch. You want to do lots of different things. But at the moment, at this particular moment in my life where I'm doing a lot of union work with my with the psychiatric labor union, doing, <laughs> I want to thank you all. <laughs> Michelle Hurd, who's here, she and I are on the National Board together. We were in the negotiating committee and we kind of oversaw the strike last year, and so that was, uh, she's an amazing mind, as well as the beauty and the talent. Um, and fired up. And when I'm fired up, she's like right there for me. Um, and now we're going to be on another committee together. Anyhow, so there's that, and then there's like my grad school. I'm, I'm racing towards the of my master's. I know a lot about Missouri. I'm just going to say. I don't know if you knew that about me. Missouri? Anybody been to Hannibal? Moving on. No, I'm not. That's a good time to take the rest. I was here to give a speech at. It was a university at one point, not too far from the spectrum. I came in on Route 66. <laughs> I thought, I know there's 400 hubcap shacks, but I'm going to start 401. I think I'm going to do you know what I'm talking about? Get that road there, where it's outside. Is there another auto shop? Yes. Another auto shop? Like, I know it's Route 66, but it's a lot of auto shops. <laughs> so the, the, the person who does the auto shop just a little bit closer to town was like, I got these beat, because people are going around. So, uh, 
But what I really am enjoying and want to do is, is comedy stuff. I just like, uh, and the thing about the Connors, which I'm on right now, is and I'm waiting to see if it gets true for my character, which I think it probably will. It gets kind of real for a minute. You know, they dealt with abuse, they dealt with drug stuff, they dealt with, uh, you know, divorce, they dealt with a lot of, and it's funny, it's funny, you know, it's a half hour sitcom, it's all funny, but every now and then they hit like a serious note. So right now I'm just enjoying the comedy and I'm looking forward to when I do if I get a little a serious hit there. But anyhow, um, if you just want to take up being an agent to represent me, you can sit here out there and look for stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do this. <laughs> Faster, these people are not gonna. I hate the moment when you're going to get through four I'm just looking back there. There's probably 40 people. So let's, let's go. I'm gonna get a little bit faster. Thank you. Lightning round. Well, that's all the people who are going to get through four minutes. If you're not in line, don't be in line. Nobody else gets in line. It's too long. Okay. Alright. Lightning round. What's your question? What's your name? My name's Bailey. Question, Bailey. No. Next. No. So, I'm a 52 year old Caucasian American. And, uh, so the At the beginning of COVID, I was going to learn the guitar. After a thousand hours, that's not going so great. But I watch a lot of World War II documentaries. <laughs> with the timer on and something about, you know, the Battle of Stalin raging. There's, there's something, I'm a history major, but there's something, I don't, I think, I thought about this, I think the reason is we know how that world ends, that world war ends. So right now we're in a time where we're like, ooh, anything can happen. We've got, you know, conflict all over the place or pandemic or whatever, like, the news and, and the kind of ambient sensation that we have a lot of time is like, any, you know, it could be really bad. Well, that was like as horrible a time as you could possibly imagine, but it had kind of an ending that was okay. I think that might be what's going on psychologically. But we also <laughs> watch a lot of comedies. New Girl. Yeah. Uh, my daughter has this big watching NCIS right now, but I just watched Suits. We have Suits. All Suits is amazing. Uh, what else? There was, a, there was a moment on Netflix where there was all these like, like spy kind of individual, like uh, like the diplomat and like the recruit and all those. I watch everything, okay? I will not be on me right now. <laughs> and I have three daughters, so that anything that's with a cake in reality or dresses or, you know, like I want every, you put, give me a princess, I'll tell you who the princess is. Moana! Moana! Ariel! Moana, Ariel. No, I didn't mean yell out the name. <laughs> And show me someone dressed and I can identify that princess for you. Where are you with me, Missouri? Okay. That was too awkward. My name is Elizabeth, and um, I have been a fan of yours since 1986 when we recorded off of TV the Brat Patrol Sunday night. Uh, deep cut. Deep cut. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I followed you, your career and things um, ever since. And my question is, how, like, what are some things that you have done to kind of stay down to earth? Um, a lot of married with three daughters. <laughs> <laughs> the five people in our house, the least coolest is Danny in front of me. Also, the way my parents raised me, they're, they're, they were very famous. Um, my mom was Patty Duke, my dad is John Aston. But by the time I came along, they weren't the fam we weren't like Hollywood people. Like one night a year there would be like a New Year's party and then all of a sudden you'd see all these famous people and you're like, oh we're like famous people. Like, <laughs> and then the rest of the time it was Little League and fighting and you know, whatever. So you there, there, there's just no tolerance for uh, not being uh, like real and understanding. And my father gave me like two really important pieces of wisdom. When I, I was a little kid, I was like Rudy, I was a little kid, I was always getting picked on and beaten up and stuff. And 
and uh, I would ask him, you know, why is this happening or whatever. His two pieces of wisdom for me, one was um, put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Put yourself, hey, why don't you try to put yourself in the other guy's shoes? Which is, if I say could stop war, you know? Uh, so, and then the other one was two wrongs don't make a right. And if you, if, if, and I listened to him, I really believed what he said. So uh, if, you, if you live a life like that, then you kind of, and oh, and he said one more thing. He said, all human interactions are sacred. Yeah. I was lucky, right? For that. That's a good dad. Thank you for that. You better ask him to book this room a little longer and push back the next sign because it's not going to be all right, go ahead. Hello. When you were on the So unexpected. I mean, did you make the issue is some sort of issue that he just wasn't like talking about publicly? But to me, that one was just like that was like a like a car crash, like something you're not expecting. And he's just such a beautiful. He was really funny. He, uh, 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 Logan's asked me about Brooklyn Nine Nine. So Brooklyn Nine Nine was on NBC, and then it was canceled. And me and uh, Mark Hamill and five or six other people were instantly on Twitter calling foul. Like, there is no way that this show has developed such an incredible audience and they've carried us along with these characters. They deserve a final season to know that it's gonna be their final season. It's outrageous that they would do that. It, it kind of got caught in that, you know, like, on, on streaming systems now, they'll do like three or four seasons and that's it. And you're like, oh, and you just kind of have to live with it. But then the next day, so we did this big out, outpouring and there was millions of retweets and that kind of stuff. And then they, um, the next day Fox picked it up. So so we were sort of like, we got the show picked up. But it would have gotten picked up either way. But uh, we were kind of like the good luck charms for the show. And that's why they put me on for an episode. And, and I remember, you know, Andre was so, um, he had such a heavy expression and a deep voice and everything. It's why when, as the captain, when he would be affectionate or do something funny, it was hilarious because it's coming out of this guy. So I'm at his desk and working on this stuff and he's leaning over me and because uh, he's supposed to be looking at the computer and they're moving the camera around and something happened. And the next thing I know, in my ear, I just feel, <laughs> and I, it, to me, it was, I, I knew I was accepted, we were like forever friends, like it was me, that, because when I walked into that set, I was a fan, a proper fan of that show, like if you got to walk on a Millennium Falcon or something, you know, you got to go into Hogwarts or something, you're like, oh my god, this is real, and, uh, and it wasn't just the bullpen, it was all the people, and so, and they were all like so happy to meet me, and I was so happy to meet them. And I was like, are we really gonna do a showdown? Like we did. Anyhow, it was pretty great. Thank you for that question. <laughs> My name is Nicholas, and I'm actually aspiring to become an actor after I graduate. I'm Stop, Nicholas. Have you committed anything? Like cool school? place. Yeah. You're not inspiring anything. You're already an actor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or working for a result 
be in a show that was world successful and everything like that. I was just doing my work and just working hard. And like, if, if there was an audition, I wanted to get the audition right. If I was working on talking to an agent or interacting with an agent, I wanted to treat it with seriousness. If I was doing a play, I wanted the play to be right. You know, I just, I, I, that's what I was thinking when, when I was doing that. When I was doing Encino Man, it was kind of like, I, I hadn't learned that you can have fun. You know, you could be like a Jim Carrey person. You know, you could just have whimsy and, and laugh and whatever. I don't know who you are, what's in your soul. But when you're, I completely co-sign on this idea that the, I think the word aspiring is a, is a, is a it's not a good word. It's not a, it's like in the, it's a bad word. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's meant to be apologetic for not having achieved what somebody else's expectation of what you might have done. So anytime you're doing anything, People will, you know, when you're dating, someone's like, oh, are you guys going steady? And then you're like, going steady. That's my boyfriend. Like, oh, are you guys going to get engaged? And then you get engaged. Like, oh, are you going to get married? And then you get married. Like, oh, are you going to have a kid? It's like, you know what? Let me live my life. <laughs> so when, when, you know, an acting career is something that people, it's a little more acceptable nowadays, but it's something that most people can't work with in their mind. So you feel like you're being judged. And it's not really you that's being judged. If it is, then they're just like jerks. But mostly it's, you know, people think, well, how are you going to make a living? And what if you, I know as a union person, I've now interacted with thousands of actors, and most of them are hustling and fighting. They've got their side hustle. They, you know, they're, they're trying. Uh, but they're determined. Their sense of their own commitment, and they, they almost don't need a lot of money. They want it to work. They want to work as an actor. They want to feel, they want to perform. They want to mine their creative life. And they want to have, and they want to be part of production, part of a show, part of a film or a television show. And when you get a movie or a TV show, then, it's, then money's important all of a sudden. But for you, you have to like know who you are and what you want, and then Whatever work means to you, whatever research, whatever, the more serious you take everything you do, the greater the chances you'll be in a position to capitalize on an opportunity where it presents itself. No pressure at all. You do? All right, what's your name? My name is Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus, what's your question? I think you were wrong of the best actor award for um, Richard of the King and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Thank you. 
each other's arms or something hanging on their face. I feel like, he, yeah, I feel like I can add to it. I know what to do. And then he asked me to sign an autograph, and he said, can you please write on this picture of you lifting Frodo that um, you think Sam and Frodo kissed? To Donna or whoever, uh, Sam and Frodo kiss. Period. And then I said, "Okay, that's not it. I wanted her to be happy. She was so happy. I lost all the red stage, but that's okay." <laughs> so we're going to give it up to me. So thank you for all you do. Uh, LGBTQ uh, yes. plus yeah. community. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, it has to be Elijah. <laughs> I hate that there's all these people been standing up here for an hour. I, I, I gotta be that guy, unfortunately. However, the questions you did not get to ask here in this forum, please stop by and Sean, I have a stay with you here today, tomorrow. Uh, you can be honored to do all that stuff there. Have you guys had a good time this past yeah.